First, uh, two apologies. One is that um, my colleague Atar Haroon was going to give most of this talk today and sadly can't be here. And secondly, I'm not a medic. I, my background is pharmacy and then various bits of oncology. So um, I apologize for that. But I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, what we can and can't do in nuclear medicine, um, perhaps uh, in addition to CT. So, nuclear medicine is one of these difficult specialties where if we don't have uh, a diagnostic molecular tool to inject, it's difficult to help. So, we uh, in nuclear medicine think if we can develop uh, a drug, a radiopharmaceutical to inject, we can probably say something about disease. So I'm going to focus this talk a bit about radiopharmaceuticals. Um, I believe I'm not allowed to walk much around the podium, but... Um, if we look at the cost of cancer, and this is a, a, clearly an American slide, you can, uh, at the cost of uh, various diseases, you can see that cancer quite outstrips um, the nearest cerebral, uh, cerebrovascular disease and heart disease. And certainly in the US, uh, well, in American dollars for the global economy, it's a huge amount of money that's spent annually on um, cancer treatment. If we then look at the number of new cases, um, 1.6 million for lung disease, uh, female breast 1.4, colorectal 1.3, and then we look at the bottom and we have um, other sites where we assume that fungal disease are very much part of at 1.6 million new cases. So clearly not something to disregard. Um, so one of the things that uh, we do fairly well in London, in a way we're privileged, is uh, positron emission tomography scanning. Um, for the Brits amongst you, we are going through a rather protracted process at the moment. Um, NHS England has recommissioned PET services uh, for about half of England, and they have divided London in several bits and Bart's Health, my august institution, and the Royal Free Hospital Hampstead and UCLH uh, form part of one lot. And we applied basically to do our own PET CT services. Um, and as I said a minute ago, London is more blessed with positron emission tomography than the rest of England. Um, if I take you back five to ten years ago, the UK was only slightly ahead of Greece, which is a country that was at the bottom, of PET scanners per number of population. Uh, what has happened in the last uh, five to ten years is the government has encouraged mobile, mobile pet facilities and we are um, in the process of increasing our um, pet scanners considerably in the United Kingdom. We are currently, as I mentioned to you, working Bart's Health with UCLH and the Royal Free to form a collaborative where it doesn't really matter which patient we look at, we will treat them um, free of access at one of those three sites. And if you want to talk to me later about 
uh, the machinations of government with regards to PET CT. I'm very happy to talk to you about that. Um, but suffice it to say that we have considerably more uh, PET scanners in the UK than we had a few years ago. Uh, at my own hospital, we not only have static PET, uh, PET CT scanners, but we also have a mobile, um, which help us with our demand. And you can see from this slide that um, Europe and the Middle East uh, has considerably less PET CT scanners compared to what our colleagues have in North America. Just as an aside, um, in North America you pay um, in excess of $10,000 for a PET CT scan, um, whereas the sort of European, average European rate is in the order of 1,500 euros or 1,200 pounds. So, positron and emission tomography, we take pictures of the body. And there is basically no modern PET scanner on the market that only look at positrons. We look at positrons with CT at the same time. However, you need a supply of radioactive pharmaceuticals, radio pharmaceuticals nearby. And without going into the physics of PET radio pharmaceuticals, all PET radio pharmaceuticals have, by nature of being positron emitters, very short half-lives. Uh, if you think of nit nitrogen 13, oxygen 15, uh, carbon 11, very short, between 2 and 20 minutes. If we think of fluorine 18, the physical half-life is what I'm talking about, is um, just over an hour. And if we think of gallium 68, which I will talk about later, it's 68 minutes. So you better be near the cyclotron that make your radio pharmaceuticals. But then we can inject and actually do molecular imaging, or we like to think of it as molecular imaging. The benefit of MRI, of course, is that you don't need radio pharmaceuticals, so there's no radiation. Um, but we use magnetism, spin, you have a very big magnet, you align the electrons, you relax, and then you build the picture. These are the pictures we look at. The top is positron emission tomography, where we injected the patient with fluorodeoxyglucose, which you most probably are aware of, and then your typical um, MR scan at the bottom. These scanners are complex, they're not cheap. Uh, we've just installed a new PET scanner at Bart, and uh, the typical price is about two million pounds for a PET scanner, PET CT scanner. Uh, we're typically doing 128 CT slices, uh, and you have lots of photomultiplier tubes um, at the uh, end of the scanner, um, but the patient comfort level is quite a bit more because you have a much bigger um, gantry that the patient can uh, lie on and go through the machine compared to MR. Um, I don't claim to own the top statement, but I like it very much. If Radio Pharmacy is the M MI5, the PET MR scanner is the new James Bond. I quote from my colleague Atar Haroon. Um, we can also combine um, PET, not with CT, but with MR. 
This is quite complex because you have um, the whole magnetism issue and photomultiplier tubes <coughs> that you need to accommodate. This is terribly, terribly expensive, but it is a one-body solution to have very, very good anatomical detail, <coughs> and then the molecular detail of the positron emission tomography. Very short scans, fast results, if your machine works. Um, we have currently, uh, I believe, two PET MR scanners in London, one at UCLH and one at uh, St. Thomas's Hospital south of the river. And without going into the physical detail, if you take a cut through the gantry, you basically have an MR scanner with lots of um, uh, coiling behind the PET detector. Um, and these, the upkeep of this alone cost uh, about, the service contract is about 500,000 pounds a year. So expensive toys. I thought I will show you a few images of PET-CT, especially related to um, <coughs> disease. Our mainstay in positron emission tomography is F18, that's the radionuclide, fluorodeoxyglucose. And this is a typical image you get. Um, Fluorodeoxyglucose um, undergoes phosphorylation by hexokinase, but unlike glucose um, and the glycolysis process, it can then not escape from the cell, so it's trapped. So the body thinks of it as glucose in the beginning, it's trapped in the cell, and then we can take images. And indeed, the images you see are of places where there's high glucose metabolism. The brain, the myocardium, uh, and then the lungs, uh, occasionally, uh, liver, spleen, and it's excreted as most small non-charged molecules through the kidneys. So three coronal images here. This is a patient with vasculitis. We injected um, FDG into the patient, uh, and we see diffuse activity in the ascending aorta, descending aorta, root of the neck, and you can also see the subclavian arteries on both sides. A very basic uh, PET scan that will take about 20 to 30 minutes to do. It's not that simple. Uh, we inject fluorodeoxyglucose. The patient then has to go into an uptake chamber, basically a overheated room to relax for half an hour. Uh, we want the patient to relax, otherwise you get a lot of brown fat uh, uptake of FDG. Um, with uh, uh, our colleagues at the Royal Free and to some extent at UCL, some people in Manchester, we're very interested in sarcoid um, at Bart's. We've had quite a bit of funding, um, the nuclear medicine team, and uh, these are images of visceral involvement uh, by sarcoid after injection of um, FDG. Um, so, another patient with sarcoidosis, uh, we can see uh, chest nodes. I don't know how the laser work. Does it work? Yeah. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, we can see uh, chest nodes and we can also see involvement in the uh, lungs and the spleen of this patient. 
Again, the bladder uptake is just excretion of the FTG. A rather pretty image of um, FTG uptake in tuberculosis. And this is tracheobronchitis. Uh, a fused uh, coronal FTG um, and CT image showing diffuse uptake in the trachea, um, but also some activity in the proximal bronchi bilaterally. So we use um, CT to give us the um, position, and then we look at the molecular activity with the glucose itself. This is tibial osteomyelitis. Um, again, FTG injected, waited 30 minutes, scanned the patient, and we see um, increased uptake of the FTG in the extending inferiorly uh, to the bone uh, cortex. patient with staph aureus septicemia uh, where we injected in the uh, FDG and uh, we got this image very interesting again I cannot interesting the um, metal artifact in, in the mitral valve um, and uh, prevert uh, uptake in a prevertebral node and uh, also a non avid pericardial diffusion on the CT. Some consolidation. HIV, um, again an FDG scan showing increased tracer uptake in the axillary lymph nodes of the patient by that. Patient with discitis and left-sided psoas abscess, um, post-injection of the FDG. Um, a supraglottic paraganglioma, very beautiful um, image. We're also looking at different radio pharmaceuticals, unlike other centers um, in and around London. We don't have a cyclotron at Bart. Um, the closest cyclotron is at St. Thomas's, and there is one at the Royal Marston in Sutton. So we are dependent on uh, radio pharmaceuticals we can buy which can be transported, so fl fluoroethylcholine um, is used here quite often for uh, uh, radio recurrence of tumors. <laughs> and we have a vision at Bart's um, to develop uh, a gallium-68 uh, radio pharmaceutical group, which we're in process. I've recently received some uh, major funding, uh, close to uh, somewhere between half a million and a million from the Bart's charity, and we're looking at gallium-68 radio pharmaceuticals. Um, gallium-68 being a metal, so you can do different types of chemistry with it. Um, the date of this workshop, workshop probably will change to a week or so earlier, but we are going to bring um, European colleagues together, uh, anyone else who wants to come, to look uh, at what we can do with gallium-68. Gallium-68 in itself is not new. Um, the uh, Mallinckrodt Radio Pharmacy at UCLH and guys in St. Thomas's 
and at the World Master, and at the World Free are already doing gallium-68 chemistry, but we want to push it. Um, there's a, a great need for this in London. Um, and we will have a workshop where we look at how to procure um, gallium-68 uh, generators. These are the boxes that make uh, gallium-68, unlike uh, cyclotron-produced um, uh, radium nuclides, you can buy a box called the generator. The generator, and apologies uh, for sharing things about physics, but the generator has a mother nuclide, germanium-68 in this case, that constantly decays to the daughter which you want to use. So germanium-68, half-life of many, many months, decays every second to gallium-68. You elude, suck off the gallium-68 from the generator and you can make radio pharmaceuticals. So we're going to talk which radio pharmaceuticals you can make with gallium-68, what stuff you need, what equipment, etc. Um, how do you validate it? How do you elude this generator to get the radioactivity? And how do you manufacture radio pharmaceuticals? So this all will happen in September here at Bart's. Um, and you can contact me if you want to come here. Um, one of the, the two main radio pharmaceuticals currently used in Europe it's not really uh, used widely in North America. Uh, gallium-68 dotatate for neuroendocrine tumors, and then gallium-68 PSMA for prostate disease. Uh, and we look at various other options for that. Thank you.